All right, folks, here he is, the man, the legend, the, legend, the myth, all of that good stuff. Dr. Nitin Jain from MD Anderson, joining me for the first time on the Healthcare Unfiltered podcast to talk all things chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Nitin, right. welcome to the show. Thank you, Chadi, for the kind invite. I've been obviously watching your show and Twitter and everything and uh, great work and really delighted to be in this uh, your show today. And talk about CLL. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, being on. And it's like the first time on the show. And uh, I want to bring you more often to more like debate stuff. But today is more like an educational thing and kind of like a fun conversation about CLL. Um, maybe a little bit about you. Just tell us a little bit about you. You know, how did you end up at MD Anderson? And and how do you split your time? What do you do day in and day out? Yes, you know, I... Um... I grew up in India. I graduated from India Medical School. Uh, it has been just about 20 years, um, actually, uh, that I graduated from med school, came here, and, uh, you know, did my fellowship, residency training, actually, in Milwaukee, Medical College of Wisconsin, for internal medicine. Me and my wife had a couple matched into the program. So she's a nephrologist, and I, you know, what we did internal medicine together. And then, actually, that, uh, that opportunity, I came to know about this leukemia fellowship, um, you know, uh, at, at Milwaukee, where you could do a leukemia fellowship actually prior to your hemonc fellowship. So that's how it kind of worked. I went toward there, uh, worked with, you know, Dr. Cortez, O'Brien, Serge Vastavshik. Actually, I was in his clinic when one of the first Ruxo treatment patients were treated back in 2007 with, with Ruxo for myelofibrosis. And we were seeing all these responses. I was just a fellow and I was like, wow, this is amazing. So any case, and then, you know, I did my training at uh, at uh, University of Chicago for a hemonc. And then, you know, I was, I had been there as always as a fellow. And, you know, I guess I had a good reputation with them. So they, so then when I was looking for a job opportunity, Dr. Cortez uh, and Dr. O'Brien, uh, Susan O'Brien, uh, both of them uh, asked me to that, uh, if I would like to come back here to join as faculty. And because I, I knew the group, I was I was doing I was uh, never I was briefly in the lab in Chicago, but really I was a clinical guy. So this I thought would be a perfect opportunity, and then you know to kind of build into the the space of lymphoid leukemia. And actually, Dr. O'Brien was one of my assigned mentors early on, um, and um, she, as you know, she obviously does CLL. She also actually does ALL when she was here. So I kind of build in that practice of, you know, continuing the lymphoid leukemia for CLL and ALL. Mateen, it's interesting. So you did the, you did a leukemia fellowship before the actual Hemon fellowship. Huh? How, how many years was that? So, so we have a leukemia fellowship program. It's still active as of now. We actually take 10 leukemia fellows each year. It's a very big program where, uh, you know, so many, there's a mix of people. So there are people who are fully trained a hematologist who come here for one or two years to train and then possibly go back to their home country. We have a couple of people from Spain right now. We have one person from India. Uh, we previously had people from Mexico and other countries. And then we have uh, people who are uh, post fellowship, Hemonk fellowship, who just wants to do one year. So there was recently a faculty. Uh, she she graduated from here. Uh, she graduated from somewhere else, came here for a year, and now she's a faculty in Miami. And then they also take people like like I did in between Hemonk, prior to Hemonk fellowship, um, and depending on the availability of the spots and things like that. So, so that's how kind of I, you know, after after internal medicine, it was a bit of a big jump because suddenly you're doing internal medicine and down you're in leukemia in Dr. Contagion's clinic. And I was like, okay, man, this is like, you know, really step up. <laughs> you have to step up your game, how to manage one of these patients are. So, so that was a, a early on, I think. But once you know, obviously, as you know, as you start doing things, and you know, then you kind of get to the hang of it. So, when I did a year of leukemia fellowship, and then actually I also did a year of leukemia fellowship at Sloan before I joined Hemonk. So at University of Chicago with you know Wendy Stock, Richard Larson, Lucy Gardley, Toy Sudeniki, people you know well, and Sony Smith. So they were already I had already done two years of leukemia. Uh, you know, clinical leukemia, practically. So it was already decided what I'm going to do in my life. I'm going to be a leukemia guy. And, um, and you know, then, what, what, what made you what made you want to do this? Was it something in residency that made you interested in leukemia? Like what got you interested in that? Yeah, you know, so, uh, you know, probably permission and hurry, right? Uh, who, yep. uh, who was at Milwaukee and now actually he, he moved on. So he was my mentor. Uh, he helped me quite a bit during my internal medicine residency in Milwaukee. And um, so, you know, he obviously is a myeloma guy. So we did some projects together. 
And um, and then, you know, he came to know about this Leukemia Fellowship uh, opportunity because my wife at that time actually had gotten a nephrology fellowship at Columbia University in New York. And I was trying to look for a position in New York for me, and there were some visa issues. So I was trying to figure out what to do. And, um, and then he said, you know, um, I just came to know about this Leukemia Fellowship at MD Anderson, and maybe you want to try it. And I was like, okay, I'm just a resident. I mean, that seems something you would love to do after your Hemong Fellowship. He said, yes, that would be true, but it looks like, you know, they're, they're obviously top group in the country, in the world, and, and it looks like they, can't, they take people. He, he came to know about that. So that's why I applied and one thing led to another. And uh, so my wife actually moved to New York for her nephrology fellowship in 07. And I moved to MD Anderson for one year. So we stayed apart for one year uh, um, and, uh, you know, doing my leukemia fellowship here. So that was actually a big transition for me, but also at the same time, I think a transition which I was worried about, but it worked out very well because I think as I started doing more and more leukemia and you know, I think we just, you get into the middle of it, right? And then you start doing it more yeah. and more, papers, yeah. research. And as you know, the group here is very, very, you know, prolific in terms of publications and case reports and retrospective analysis, prospective trials. So, you know, really started working with Cortez and Serge, uh, Susan O'Brien, <clears throat> you know, uh, some stuff with GGM, Garcia Monero at that time. So, you know, and that book chapters all those things so you know i think you get in the middle of it and oh yeah and they, you know hey they they threw you in contagions clinic like you know that is that will get you into shape in like two you know you get... <laughs> so that's that's uh that's true so yeah i mean he you know he's, he's a great guy so i obviously he's he's instrumental in me uh, being hired back here 10 years ago and actually he's one of my biggest uh, i mean i think my biggest supporters here and who he's, has helped me a lot uh, in my career so far one of the greatest mentors uh, out there. So we want to talk a little at CLL because what I wanted to do is really kind of more tackle, um, you know, the top of the mind type of topics that come to CLL uh, treaters. Because, you know, for you at MD Anderson, you treat a lot of CLL patients. Um, for the average oncologist out there, they probably see five to 10 a year. I mean, that's sure. the reality, right? So our goal is to kind of simplify things. That's one goal. And uh, the way I'm thinking about this uh, is several topics. So the first one is we have grown to learn that there is no cancer is good, but there's like good CLL and not so good CLL, like bad CLL. Yeah. Um, are you seeing that people are checking for that? What, how do you differentiate between good and bad CLL? Um, and do you do you do you have to do this for every single patient in routine clinical care? I ask because oftentimes people say, "Look, a lot of my CLL patients, I'm going to observe. I'm not going to treat because they have no right. symptoms that need therapy. Right. Why do I need to check whether they have the right. bad CLL or not?" Yeah, so, you know, it's a, it's a good question. It, to be very honest with you, it comes up quite often uh, in discussions with the local oncologist and other, you know, talks with the fellows and things like that. So I think in 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 all fairness, if you'd say, okay, I want to sit back and my patient is happy, he just writes his zero CLL, I'm just going to watch it. And when he progresses five years or seven years, X, Y, Z time down the line, I'm going to check it. I think that's maybe okay. But there are a few things which don't change for an individual patient's life, like IGHV status. Immunoglobulin mutation gene status for individual patient never changes in their lifetime. So if you are mutated IGH, you're always mutated. If you're unmutated, you're always unmutated. So that's a test you need to do only one time in your life or patient's lifespan. So why not do it right now so that you know? Because we know if you're unmutated, you're more likely to need treatment in the next few years as opposed to mutated, which can do 10 plus years, you know, well. So I can tell the patient that, hey, you have a mutated IGHV, you have a deletion 13Q, kind of the best prognostic marker. The time to treatment may be 10 plus years. We're really doing very well. Don't worry. Everything will be fine. Off the flip side, I have unmutated patients with complex karyotype and a P53 mutation or a deletion 17P. Then I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm not going to treat this patient today because he doesn't need treatment, but he may need treatment in the next one to two years or three years. So I need to just watch him a bit closely because he's going to progress likely faster than usual. So to me, having that information helps me 
and maybe educating the patient as well about their disease. And to be frank, you know, many times patients are also wanting to know because they have Googled it and they have they, they kind of know what things to kind of, you know, what the doctor will be checking. But if you want to be really say, okay, no, but still I want to not check it. And my practice is to just check it to when the patient needs treatment. I think I cannot really argue against that. But I think to me, and I think in my clinic, it helps me knowing that information for patients just to kind of figure it Tell the patients as well what to think long term, what to expect. And I think if I'm a patient myself and I have a disease in which disease could go 10 plus years without treatment and maybe two, three years requiring treatment, I may want, I want to know uh, upfront, you know, I don't need the treatment today, but I want to know if my disease on an average is expected to progress sooner or later. Nitin, so you mentioned yeah. that you mentioned something about the chromosomes, uh, yeah. the 17p and the p53, the the tumor suppressor gene, and and then you mentioned the IGVH mutational status. Are they mutually exclusive? What I mean by that, if you have the mutated one, if you have right. the mutated IGVH, which is the good prognostic one, right? Do you always not have the 17p and the 11q, or you can have Mix. Yeah, so you know it's a good question, and it can be uh, it's it can be different combinations. So in fact, just a few days ago, there was a paper published, and I tweeted it out from the Eric Cooperative Group, or it's a cooperative group in Europe. You know, they they do all the things CLL together. So they they were looking at the time to first treatment for patients from the original diagnosis, and what they looked at is they look at 17p patients, and in fact, in their series, 60% of 17p were unmutated for IGHV, 40% were mutated for IGHV. So almost kind of somewhat equal split. But if you're unmutated, you need treatment within two to three years. If you're mutated IGHV and deletion 17P, you're still doing very well, actually five, 10 years down the line. Interesting. So, so, so yeah, so I think knowing, uh, so if you want to say, okay, what is the minimum prognostic markers you need to check for a patient with CLL these days? I think IGHV testing, which as I said, is only one time needs to be done. CLL fish panel, which I think most of the doctors are doing these days. And the one important thing is the TP53 mutation. Because you know what we think is, okay, if I'm a patient, I have done CLL fish panel, it does not show 17P deletion, so we, I'm good. But actually, no, there could be patient who have deletion 13Q, patient who have deletion 13, 11Q, normal fish or trisomy 12, who can have a TP53 mutation. And that has same connotation, same meaning as having a deletion 17P. So checking for a P53 mutation is also important, which gets missed many times in the general practice. People check for CLL fish panel most of the time. Many times they check for IGHV status. But the TP53 mutation assay, which is the same assay used, used for TP3 mutation for you know, AML patients and whatnot, um, you know, and generally as part of a multiple sequencing panel, you know, it's not just one gene you check, you check a bunch of different genes. But I think those three, P53 mutation, IGHV status, CLL fish panel. And I think if you can also get a, a conventional cytogenetics to see if it's complex yeah. karyotype or yeah. not, that kind of rounds up the, I guess, the, the really the practical uh, prognostic markers you need to know. But at least the first three one, the P53, IGHV, and FISH panel, I think are really important. So um, now we, let's say we have a patient that requires therapy. Yeah. And in front of you, there is no question that the patient requires therapy. Take us through what goes through your mind. I mean, there's so many advances, lots of good treatments. And you guys at MD Anderson have pioneered a lot of the new therapies that we have today. And you have a lot of great papers that uh, that I love that I'm sure you'll mention uh, during today. But but what goes through your mind in making a decision what to treat that how to treat that patient? So I think one thing which is kind of clear, I think, which was a different discussion maybe five seven years ago, is the chemotherapy question. Right? Is there any patient I would use FCR or BR or clarambosol, which are the three kind of main chemotherapy regimens we have used over the course of the last two decades? And I would say no. I think really we at MD Anderson and I think most CLL uh, centers of excellence to say in the country and I think moved away from chemotherapy completely. So so we should not be using chemotherapy for our patients. I think that's very clear. So if it's not the chemotherapy, what else? We, we use, you guys used to tell us that for the mutated IG, 
VH, you used to say we would still use chemotherapy. Uh, is that not the case anymore? So that's uh, that was the case, yeah, you know, up until five years ago. And then we did a subsequent trial called IFCG, where we replaced rituxan with obinutuzumab and added a brutinib to it. We, we did that study, we treated 67 patients. We're we are updating a five-year update on that study now. Uh, but at the end of the day, the problem is, uh, as you know, with chemotherapy is therapy-related MDS and AML, which can occur in a small percentage of patients, maybe three or four percent. But that's still a significant amount because if you get an MDS AML after you know FCR or BR or anything like that, that's really is you know it's not good. And um, and you know randomized studies of FCR or BR with ibrutinib or acalabrutinib or zonabrutinib or VNG, everyone has shown that target therapies are better PFS. Some have shown better OS, not every everyone, but at least better PFS. So, you know, now the point you're saying, okay, so for this mutated group of patients, which certainly I think if you do that, there is a cure fraction of about 50 to 55%. At 10 years, they're they are alive and in remission and doing well. The problem is that you don't know upfront who these patients are going to be. And again, some of these patients may end up with MDS and AML. And then more recently, as you know, so the uh, the ECOG trial, which Tate Shanafield had presented, um, which you give FCR versus ibrutinib rituxan to patients. And in a longer follow-up of that trial, a five-year follow-up, even for the mutated IGHV group, FCR was statistically inferior in PFS than ibrutinib rituximab. So unmuted, it was already known. Unmuted is ibrutinib is better than FCR, but for the mutated, for the longer follow-up, uh, ibrutinib wins over FCR or PFS. So, you know, I think all in all, I think, so if, if yes, if you say, okay, I we have in a limited resource setting or something, which is, you know, some other country, you know, India or other country, Eastern European, wherever, you want to say, okay, we want to consider FCR, then yes, I think mutated young patient without T53 mutation or deletion 17T is an appropriate candidate. And I think that's that's fair. I think in the US, because we have access to all these drugs covered by insurance, I think the role for chemotherapy, including for this subset of patients is, is gone. So we don't use it at all. The IFCG trial, which was the last trial we had with chemotherapy, we stopped accrual to that trial about, I would say, one and a half, two years ago. Um, so, so right now we have no clinical trials with chemotherapy at all. So no chemotherapy, then you have the target therapies. And now right. you've, got, you've got the BTK inhibitors. And yeah. you have, uh, to my knowledge, at least three of them that are fighting each other between ibrutinib, right. calabrutinib, and zenobrutinib. And now we right. have uh, pyrobrutinib, but I don't think it's approved for CLL yet. We're taping this, by the way, in mid-February 2023, so it may get approved by then. But um, And then you've got the venetoclax, uh, sure. right? And then you've got the anti-CH20, obintuzumab versus right. obintuzumab. So I'm having headache already just <laughs> listening all of you. Clarify them for me. Yeah, so I think... Um... Few things have become easier over the years. I think, yes, I mean, all these options are great options, but I think few things have become clear. So, yes, you're correct. Three BTK inhibitors, Ibrutinib, Zanu, in, in order of approval, Ibrutinib, Akalabrutinib, and Zanu were just, you know, a few weeks ago. So, I think, you know, with Ibrutinib, it's a fantastic drug. It was the first one in the market, approved back in 2014 for CLL. Um, the, the problem, which over the years we have realized, is it's a fantastic drug, but it causes atrial fibrillation. This issue of ventricular tachycardia and sudden cardiac death, hypertension, arthralgias, bleeding issues, which for the longest time, we were fine with it because that was the only drug available. There was nothing else. But then Akala has come along and more recently Zanu. And the head-to-head -head trials, two head-to-head -head trials were done where both uh, with Akala Brutinib, it showed Akala Brutinib is equally effective but safer then the Brutinib in relapse CLL. And then Zanobrutinib trial was more recent, just published in New England Journal, which showed Zanobrutinib is actually more effective as well as safer than Ibrutinib. You know, so given that we have these two trials, randomized studies, I really think the role for Ibrutinib has declined. So we have practically stopped prescribing Ibrutinib for our patients. Also, of a clinical trial setting, um, I am using Akala, and now probably Zanu because Zanu is just coming along. But, but the Akala and Zanu trials were these in real life disease? 
Correct. So we are the, the, the randomized studies were in relapsed disease. So what we are doing is extrapolating that safety from the relapsed disease to this frontline. Because, you know, the expectation is that the safety aspect of, uh, you know, the drugs will stay the same, whether it's relapsed disease or frontline. You know, efficacy may be different, obviously. So we are extrapolating from relapsed disease to the frontline. So, yes, in the frontline, we have a brutinib, and zanu, but the fact that in the relapsed disease, we know uh, second generation, Akala and Zanu are safer than a Brutnib, probably that would apply to frontline as well. So, nice. so yeah, so so I think a Brutnib, I tell the patients when I'm discussing the patients, I put them on a page, page, sheet of paper. I said a Brutnib, Akala, Zanu, a Brutnib, more side, great drug, more side effect, has the longest track record for sure, and the maximum number of patients have been treated in the world with this drug. But now we have safer agents. And then Akala and Zanu, I think, uh, between the two, I don't think there is any way we can distinguish. I mean, there are minor, finer points, but I think it really is your own preference to see which one you want to pick in a way uh, which you're more comfortable with. Up until now, or up until a few weeks ago, Zanu was not even available for CLL, so that was not a question at all. It has just become a question now with Akala and Zanu. So I don't think we can say one drug is better than the other. I think both are fantastic drug, and I think you can pick any any of those who you want. And then the third pile is the venetoclax, you know, so that's venetoclax plus obinituzumab, and that's given for one year. As opposed before, to, before you go to venetoclax, yeah. when you use ibrutinib or Zanu or Akala, and I think I heard from you, you don't use ibrutinib pretty much almost never at this point. Is it always by themselves or you add an anti-CD20 antibody? Yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, the, the data we have with anti-CD20 antibody is really with Akala brutinib. So we have with Ibrutinib also. There was a study done with the Rituximab. There was no benefit. Um, there was a study done with Obinituzumab. There was, but it was not a randomized study. And uh, in a cross cell comparison, it does look maybe Obinituzumab adds to Ibrutinib. But the real study which shows the benefit is the Elevate study, where Elevate uh, TN study, sorry, where frontline patients were given Akala versus Akala Obin, and there was a chlorambucil control arm. But forget about that. And when they did Akala Obin versus Akala, at five-year time point, there was about 12 percentage point PFS improvement. So Akala Obin was 84%, Akala alone was 72%. So you can say, okay, that's great. I mean, if I use Akala Obin, I will get 10 percentage point PFS improvement for my patient. The downside there is you have to give Obin infusion reaction, more neutropenia, more side effects, more cost to the system. So, and then if you're really going to use Obin, why not just do venetoclax or venetoclax, right? I mean, that's a timely approach for my patients, right? Uh, rather than just doing this and then still continuing a color for forever. So in my practice, if I'm using it, I'm using BTK as a single agent. Like, you know, I, I'm not combining it with CGRNT antibody. But you certainly can combine, especially with a color brutinib, the label also says with and without a venetoclax. So if you want to maybe get a faster response for your patient, uh, you want for your patient to get MRD negative remission because Akala Obin will get you some MRD negative remissions as well. Um, I think it's fine to use, but right. I think from a practical standpoint, when I'm using the, when I'm discussing with the patient, one of the reasons they want to do Akala Brutnib or Zana Brutnib is that it's just a pill and yeah. it's easy, right? So it's not that complicated. One of the reasons people don't want to do Vinitoclax or Vinitoclax is that there is an IV component to it. Right. So, right. So that's the appeal of a color BTK inhibitor. I think it's the best, in my opinion, it's a single agent. And then the, the last ASH meeting, there was the Alpine study. And I think um, Jennifer Brown published in the NEJM the um, the, the paper, obviously, on right. Zanu versus Ibrutinib. There were some, you know, I mean, what did you think of that? I mean, there was, you know, the endpoints was not obviously overall survival. There was, I'm not really sure what are the high-risk patients versus non-high-risk patients. I mean, they... Are you pretty convinced that zanobrutinib is a more is a superior drug to ibrutinib? So I'm I'm convinced that zanobrutinib is a safer drug to ibrutinib, which I think is is fair. Whether it's a, it's a superior drug to ibrutinib, I think at least in this trial, on the face of it, that's what the trial says, and I think you know we have to kind of believe that in a way. But you know there are arguments which are you know uh, like some arguments like okay. The uh, 
the control arm, the ibrutinib arm, somewhat was underperforming compared to what the historical control has been. So that is one of the issues with the with the trial. It's an open label study. It was done in the more recent era, and in the more recent era, there was already a big you know thing about people knowing about ibrutinib side effects, right? I mean, the last few years, we all have been thinking about ibrutinib. You know, maybe not a, that that great of a drug for side effects. So it quite have possibly shifted the clinicians. If I'm a doctor and my patient is on ibrutinib and he's having some side effects, I know compared arm is on ibrutinib and it was like, oh yeah, it's probably ibrutinib, you know, maybe more likely to switch therapy, um, you know, for my patients because I know which drug they are getting. So, you know, having said that, I think, you know, the data is the data and, you know, it's it's superior. So I think what the trial, that trial tells me is that I should not be using ibrutinib for my patient. But what that trial does not tell me is that that zanubrutinib is better than acalabrutinib. Yeah. Because acalabrutinib was a different trial. It's a longer run trial for four years. Um, and uh, Alpine studying only two years follow up. And uh, so it's, you know, it's one of those things. Yes, one is better than a brutinib, one is equal to a brutinib, but that doesn't mean, uh, you know, they are, that we should be using zanubrutinib. So in my opinion, we should be using a second generation, but uh, either it could be a kala or zanubrutinib. So now to add the, to the confusion, which is good for patients because there are more options, you've got the vinitoclax of the world, which is an anti-BCL2 inhibitor, and it's uh, it's another oral therapy. Right. So how do you, what's going on there with vinitoclax alone, with anti-CD20, and how do you decide between that versus the BTK inhibitors? Yeah, so, you know, vinitoclax is a fantastic drug, and you know, it works great, not just for CLL, obviously, AML, and so many other diseases these days. So um, you know, so venetoclax plus obinutuzumab, the biggest advantage is that it's a one-year therapy. Venetoclax is for one year, obinutuzumab for six months, and then you're done, right? There is no more therapy. Patients are off therapy, and they have a feeling that they are done with the treatment, right? So that's a good feeling to have. I'm done with my cancer therapy. I'm not taking still a cancer pill every day. And the data supports that, right? So the CLL-14 study from General Cell Study Group, which led to the approval of this regimen at five-year mark, about 63% of the patients are in remission. If you say, if you ask me, okay, what is the number with the oh, What was account? that study? What was it comparing? Uh, it was comparing venetoclax or venetuzumab versus chlorambicil venetuzumab. So obviously disregard the chlorambicil part. But if you just follow the patients on the venetoclax or venetuzumab, they got one year of therapy. And then remaining follow-up is just treatment-free interval. And at five years, their PFS, which they reported at last EHA, was 63%. Okay, so at five years, 63% are progression-free. If you look at the Ibrutinib, the Resonate 2 study, which was the approval of Ibrutinib for CLL in the frontline setting, which is Ibrutinib versus Chlorambucil, the five-year PFS was 70%, 7-0. And so what I'm trying to say is that at five-year mark, these PFS curves are about, you know, maybe 65 to 70% for these different drugs. Um, advantage of venetoclaxobinituzumab is you only go one year of therapy. Rest is treatment free interval. The somewhat disadvantage of a BTK inhibitor, which of the three you want to pick, is that you'll have to keep taking it every day. So, so that's so that's one aspect which kind of favors venetoclaxobinituzumab. But obviously, venetoclaxobinituzumab, um, some of the issues are that it, it causes neutropenia, grade, four, grade three or four neutropenia, which is ANC of less than one, about 50% of the patients. So, you have to watch your patients for neutropenia. Neuroclax could cause tumor lysis syndrome. So you have to watch them logistically. You know, they'll come to the lab often and check their labs and things like that. And obinituzumab is IV. So then, you know, infusion reaction and all those things. So those are the kind of downsides of the venetoclax obinituzumab based regimen. Also, it does not work very well long term for deletion 17P or P53 mediated patients, right? So for those patients, you really have to think about a BTK inhibitor. So, so those are, you know, some of the issues which I think are there when you are, uh, so I, I discuss these issues with the patient, right? I mean, I tell them these are the regimens, these are the pros and cons of the two approaches. Um, they work really equally well. And uh, venetoclax of nituzumab, time-limited approach, but you have to come quite often early on, lab monitoring and all those things. Versus BTK inhibitor, which is pretty straightforward to start with, but you have to take it for the rest of your life and risk of AFib bleeding issues, those kind of things remain. And then, you know, patients can decide which one they want to pick. I would say most patients 
go with venetoclax or bendozumab because they feel they'll be done. But there are other patients who said, I don't mind taking a pill and I'm, I'm happy just taking a pill. So let's 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 dissect this just a little bit because I think that's yeah. really where the controversy is. I think that's a good yeah. segue for some of the controversies. First controversy. I think that people will say, you know, why is even corambisol remains to be a comparator arm? I mean, you just mentioned to me that the CL14 compared vinitoclax with obintuzumab versus chlorambicil plus obintuzumab. Right. Um, I'll admit the last time I've used chlorambicil was 1999. I'm much older than you, Nitin. So sure. um, what's, I mean, what, why are we still doing chlorambicil? Because, you know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a legit question. Would you agree? Yeah, no, absolutely correct. So I think we have to, you know, some of these things you have to go back of the time these trials were designed, right? Because CLL-14 trial, was first reported back in 2019, was designed probably in 2013, 2014, because then it takes you know so much time to enroll the patients, have a follow-up, right? So the things change, right? I mean, in 2013, 2014, we were still using FCR for for, for CLL, right? So and clarimazolobinituzumab, certainly not in the US, but in the Europe, was considered an appropriate regimen for patients with CLL. So this is 2014, 2015. I completely agree with you that in today's world, if I'm designing clinical trial today, and if someone were to ask me or if a company approaches me that, oh, we, are, we have a clinical trial in which, you know, can you participate where the control arm is chlorambicil or some chemo? I will say, no, I'm not going to because that is not correct for our patients and we should not be doing that. So I think things change. So in today's world today, I would say absolutely no, it should not be the case. I think you have to then go back. So, for example, like, you know, we did a trial with the plus Venetoclax, which is not a chemo trial at all, but, you know, we are updating the data now. But if you go back to when we designed the study, because sometimes people say, okay, in our trial, we did two years of Ibrutinib plus Venetoclax and other studies have done one year. And people say, oh, why you did two years? Because we designed this trial in actually also 2014. The trial started in 2016. In 2014, that was before Venetoclax was even FDA approved for anything. So, this is just a hunch or, you know, educated guess at that time of what a duration of treatment should be and then how the trial starts and then trial accrues. And, you know, we're still learning about the duration of the combination therapy. So in my mind, I think once you have these kind of things, you have to go back to see what was the standard at that time was when that trial was designed. So I completely agree that today's world, I don't think any trial should be done in CLL or planned in CLL where the comparator is a chemotherapy. I actually remember one of your Twitter threads, <clears throat> which I loved. I have it bookmarked on clinical trials. Oh. You, were, you were writing about, uh, you know, the life of a clinical trialist. It was funny, but it was true. It was like so <laughs> true. Okay, second question. People will say obintuzumab is just a rituxan, just with higher dose of rituxan, yeah. of like, you know, a sexier rituxan. Yeah. So what do you say to that? Well, I mean, I think... <sighs> That may be true. That may be true. And I'm not the one to say that that may not be true. Um, unfortunately, there has been no trial which are done with obintuzumab versus higher doses of rituximab, you know, head to head, right? So the trial which have been, there are two trials in CLL, which have compared obinituzumab and rituximab. So one was an older trial, CL11 trial, you may recall, chlorambicil obinituzumab versus chlorambicil rituximab. This I was It was older, older patients, right? Older patients, right. And that showed that chlorambicil obinituzumab is better than chlorambicil rituximab, and that's why chlorambicil obinituzumab became kind of the new standard for older patients. But, and then, you know, then ibrutinib came along, venetoclax came along, um, and then lots of trials. But there was never a trial up until now called CLL-13 trial, which uh, uh, German CLL study group reported last year, or ASH 2021, where they compared head-to-head -head rituxan versus ven obinituzumab. Okay, so the trial had four arms. So they are younger patients with CLL, typically less than 65 years of age. They got or FCR if they're less than 65, BR if they're older than 65 as a control arm. Venetoclax rituximab, venetoclax obinituzumab. And the third arm was venetoclax, obinituzumab, and ibrutinib. So they also added ibrutinib. So, so kind of a nice trial, large trial, I think 920 patients, something like that. So the final conclusion in a nutshell was that venetoclax obinituzumab 
had higher MRD rates than unitoclax rituximab, and the PFS of unitoclax rituximab was also higher than unitoclax rituximab, right? So, so I think in the context of CLL, this trial specifically really proves that head-to-head -head comparison when G or when obinutuzumab per se is, has higher MRD rate than when R and a better PFS. Now, you can say, okay, but that's still maybe you're using so much higher doses of this obinutuzumab. Um, maybe that's what it is. It's just a glorified rituximab, again, which may be true, but unfortunately, we don't have a trial in which we are comparing when with you know, three times a week of rituximab or, you know, some kind of a higher doses or higher intensity of rituximab to compare to obinutuzumab to make it equal and do that trial. No one has done that trial. Yeah. So, so it's, it's one of those things which is, which may be true, but at the end of the day, um, there is no data to kind of support that I can just increase the doses of my rituximab and achieve the same benefit. Right. The third, the third question, which you alluded to a little bit, but I'm going to actually bring it uh, differently. You mentioned MRD a couple of times in your answer, which stands for minimal residual disease or measurable residual disease. You you had mentioned that the venetoclax is a, a, a duration of therapy. It's like one year of treatment and then you stop. A, do you stop regardless of minimal residual disease? And B, I think minimal residual disease as a topic is the most debated controversial topic on social media and it's probably a topic where people might go to war eventually about this <laughs> so you're a peaceful man <laughs> and you're going to help us resolve it a outside of a clinical trial clinical trial all is allowed but outside of a clinical trial how do you think people should use mrd that's one question number two is there even a consensus of which method method to use for MRD? And number three, is there even a consensus? What do you, how do you define MRD negative? Because I think you guys are pioneer in improving the assays to detect MRD. And it's almost like, how low can you go? I mean, right. you know? Right. So help right. us understand that. Yeah, so it's a, it's a it's a complicated topic. I think it's a, and it's a topic, I agree with you that you can really take a strong position one way or the other you know, and and it's and both sides are correct in their own 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 kind of viewpoints. So I think in a clinical practice, I think one important point to remember is that this comes up quite often is that I would hear from a physician that, oh, my patient is on ibrutinib. They have been on ibrutinib for three years. And, you know, they are thinking of stopping ibrutinib. So I'm thinking of checking an MRD and, you know, and if MRD is negative, then I'm going to stop the ibrutinib, you know. And my answer to them would be that, Patients with on single agent ibrutinib or acalabrutinib or zanabrutinib will never become MRD negative. They will always be MRD positive. You don't get MRD negativity unless you add a C20 antibody or you add venetoclax or it's a venetoclax based, based strategy. So if you're a single agent ibrutinib, there is no reason to check MRD for your patients because you'll never become MRD negative. And there's, so I don't check it at all. There's no reason. There's no reason to do a bone marrow. There's no reason to do a peripheral blood MRD uh, to check for MRD, bone marrow to check for MRD. So, so that's the majority of the patients in the practice these days, right? They are on BTK inhibitors. So I don't think MRD should be done. There is no data and they, they will not become MRD negative. So on a practical level, I think the only place where in a standard of care setting, MRD may have a role is when you're using venetoclax based therapy and where you want to stop therapy. So for example, CRL14, uh, the frontline uh, venetoclax of venetuzumab is one year therapy, right? And the recommendation, you stop everyone at one year, right? It is recommendation, the approval label doesn't talk about MRD at all. It just talk, okay, you just do one year and be done. Now, you could potentially, and again, you know, check an MRD at that time and see, okay, if my patient is MRD negative, I will feel comfortable because I know if they're MRD negative at one year mark, yes, they're stopping the therapy, but I can tell the patient you're MRD negative, the chance of your leukemia coming back down the line is low. It's not zero, it's low. If you're MRD positive, certainly it's an information for the patient that you're MRD positive, the chance of leukemia coming back down the line is higher. It's not 100%, but it's higher. Now the question becomes, okay, but that's a prognostication value you have, but are you going to act on it? If my patient is MRD positive 0.2% at one year, should I be doing something different or should I just be stopping therapy as I was intended to stop? 
And I think that's a difficult thing to argue today because we really don't have data that if I say, okay, yeah, I mean, if you're already positive, maybe continue longer, but people will say, okay, but is there any data? Actually, no, you know, like so, but data is being generated right now. So what I do in my practice is that I think in the frontline setting, I'm very comfortable stopping uh, one year after one year, irrespective of the MRD. I do check the MRD more for prognostication so that I can tell the patient, hey, you're MRD negative, you're good. Otherwise, you're MRD positive. Now, if the patient doesn't want to know, you know, it's fine. But I think most patients, when they go into this one-year time-limited therapy, as opposed to a BTK therapy, one of their, mi their mindset is they want to become depth of remission, you know, so they want to know what their MRD status is at the end of treatment. But so, so in the frontline setting, I really don't make any treatment decisions based on MRD. It's more for prognostication. But, but you, you mentioned earlier that you you use the treatment decision based on the 17P. Like you said, you use venetoclax is not very good for the 17P or something. Right. So for 17P patients upfront, I start them on a BTK. Like I will start them on Akala or Zanu. And I will keep them long term on Akala and Zanu. So I'm not stopping the treatment. And so there's no need for MRD or check. Now, when you Patient is a relapsed CLL, and I have several relapsed CLL who have made multiple times FCR 10 years ago, then Ibrutinib for five years, then something else maybe, then Venetoclax, and they are 17P deleted. Those patients, I think, are really tough spot, tough patients who had failed these both Ibrutinib and they're on Venetoclax, and you know, you really don't want them to fail Venetoclax. And again, the Murano study, which led to the approval in the relapse setting, says two years of Venetoclax. And then you stop at two years. And again, which is, I think, fair. And the recommendation is to stop it irrespective of the MRD, which is, I think, okay. But in my clinical practice, if I have a patient who has a 17P deletion, complex karyotype, unmuted VG, and I recently saw two patients back-to-back -back with very complicated history and tough situations where I'm then really worried about stopping Venetoclax for these patients. And, you know, I do sometimes continue longer when it affects. And for these patients, I do check the MRD because if they are becoming MRD negative, at least I'm really hopeful in my mind that, you know, that their remission duration will be very long, uh, you know, versus they are still MRD positive. Then I'm really worried that, yes, I could stop Venetoclax, but these patients are going to relapse within two or three months or six months. I mean, this is not a salvageable situation where I can just stop because Murano study said two years. Okay, I stop at two years and then sit tight. No. If they're MRD positive at that time or 1%, 2% MRD, they're probably going to relapse within the next six months. So I really need to start thinking about the next course of action pretty quickly. How do you check MRD? How do you check MRD? Because back in the day, yeah, it was, believe it or not, it was a four-color flow cytometry. Yeah. Where are we now? <laughs> so I think the, the flow cytometry has improved a bit, but our assessment, so I just do it in the peripheral blood. You can do it in the bone marrow, and we do it in bone marrow as part of trials quite often. But if a patient is not in the trial in the standard of care setting, I just do it in the peripheral blood. We do a flow cytometry as well in-house, which is sensitivity of 10 to the power of minus 4, so 0.01%, which is the standard um, flow cytometry cutoff for MRD for CLL, established cross. Now, increasingly, you know, uh, some data from um, next generation sequencing. So the most uh, only approved assay is actually the clonosic assay. Um, we are starting to use that as part of clinical trials right now. Um, you know, the data with clonosic, which can go to 10 to the power of minus six, you know, 10 to the power of, yeah, uh, one, mil one in one million sensitivity. So hundredfold higher or deeper than flow cytometry um, is just emerging. Lots of clinical trials are reporting data with clonosic assay, this next generation MRD assay. It remains to be seen in my mind if, if you really need to do, go that deep with the MRD assessment in the context of CLL right now. I think in my practice, I think 10 to the power minus four with flow right now seems to serve the purpose which I'm looking for. But certainly I think the deeper you go, if my patient becomes MRD negative with at 10 to the power minus six, that really tells something that this patient is going to do really well long term. Yeah, but but when you check, when you're monitoring these patients with MRD nitin, right? Um, and I don't know, let's say you check in every three months or every six yeah. months, whatever duration you're doing, and you detect that somebody was negative became positive. Is there any data today 
that you need to intervene at the time of MRD positivity? No, absolutely not. And I, I don't think you should intervene in the clinical practice. I don't at all. Um, I think MRD in CLL has a different meaning than MRD in AML and MRD in ALL. Because those acute leukemias, if you have MRD, if you don't do anything, they will relapse in the next few months. CLL is a different thing. I mean, obviously, if patients have full of disease early on in their, like, they have a white of 30,000 with 90% lymphocyte, which is all, you know, CLL cells. These are, you know, and you don't treat them, right? You wait, watch and wait, watch and wait. So CLL, I think treating MRD, if they're doing it as part of a clinical trial, it's okay because we are trying to establish some medical data and 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 generate some research. But if you're in clinical practice, I don't think you should be treating MRD. Um, if you're checking MRD, um, if you're checking MRD for prognostication, that's fine. But if someone becomes positive, you should not act on it because you can become MRD positive and still many years may go by, go by before you actually need treatment for that patient. You know, so right, right. there's no reason to treat MRD positive positivity. Okay, so now I'm going to move a little bit to relapse disease. And, you know, I don't think I'm uh, really uh, being a spoiler alert. Obviously, the treatment of relapse disease depends on what you used in frontline, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, so l let's go through, uh, I don't know, is it too simple to say if you use the BTK, you use a venetoclax, if you use venetoclax, you use a PTK? Are these the only two? Um, or in clinical practice, do you guys still use idelisib? Can you use, if you failed ibrutinib, can you use Acala? If you used, if you failed Acala, can you use Zanu? Like, what? How do you relapse disease patient in front of you? How yeah. do you approach that? Yeah, so I think some of the points you mentioned are crucial, right? So it depends on what they received before, right? So if they never had, I mean. But these days, most of the patients, when they come in relapsed disease, they probably had already had some target therapy. You know, it will be less likely that a patient is coming to you who got FCR 10 years ago, and then they're relapsing today. It's a rare patient. Most patients have received already some BTK in the frontline setting, most commonly them just because it was in the market the first, first to go come around. So if a patient had Ibrutinib before or BTK before, um, so the important point is that BT, Ibrutinib, Akala, and Zanu they all are what is called covalent BTK inhibitors. They bind to cysteine 481 as pocket, cysteine 481 pocket in the BTK protein. So if you are resistant to ibrutinib, Akala or Zanu are not going to help or vice versa. So, however, if you're intolerant to ibrutinib, which several patients are, then certainly going to Zanu or Akala is a fair argument because uh, they are safer and patients can tolerate the drug better. And then, you know, coming to the venetoclax question, yes, if a patient had ibrutinib before, if they're relapsing on ibrutinib or acalabrutinib, yes, the next option should be venetoclax-based therapy. Now, if they had venetoclax before, like one-year therapy of venetoclax venetuzumab, let's suppose five years go by and they are relapsing at five-year mark. So that patient actually, because that patient was not on venetoclax when they relapsed, there were only four or five years of treatment-free interval very likely that patient is still sensitive to venetoclax. And in fact, a trial is being done right now to assess that very question. So, so you can potentially, I guess, retreat them with venetoclax or venetuzumab and get another four or five year mileage out of it. Or certainly you can go to ibrutinib or akala or zanubrutinib. So, so that's kind of is the, I think the first two regimens is the BTK and, and VEN and in, in some fashion. I think after that, in the third line to say, and fourth line, things become a bit more complicated. I would say in that setting, we have adalisib and dovalisib approved, you know, and, and they are kind of have a bad reputation because of mm -hmm. immune function, immune side effects and, and CMV and all those things. So, so, but certainly can be used. And I think I'm personally excited about a pirtobrutinib, which as you mentioned early on, was just approved for mental cell lymphoma it is not yet approved for CLL. We're hoping eventually it will approve for CLL as well, but at least it's commercially available. So in fact, just actually this week, we are writing a prescription for off-label use for a for patient who really needs but, it. But, but uh, would it work if somebody has received the BTK and the venetoclax? So, so that's the, so the trial which they did, the Bruin trial, which is a very large study, um, practically everyone had failed a BTK because pirtobrutinib is 
and there's a nemtabrutinib, which is another kind of a drug. Prito and nemtabrutinib are what are called reversible BTK inhibitors. So yes, they are BTK inhibitors, but they actually do not bind to the cysteine-481S pocket. So because they do not bind to that pocket to block the BTK, they work against uh, in patients who have failed ibrutinib or failed acalabrutinib. Uh, the data with ZANU, I think, is still upcoming, but at least with ibrutinib and acalabrutinib. So, 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 so yes, yeah, so certainly you can use them, and that's what the trial did, actually. Majority of the patients had prior BTK, and actually almost 40% of the patients had prior renetoclax as well. So, so the clinical trial, which which uh, which is being done for uh, pirtobrutinib. So yeah, so pirtobrutinib is a drug which certainly would be a very appropriate drug to consider. Hopefully, officially we'll get FDA approved right. or whatever, mm -hmm. and then maybe the NCSN guidelines. I'm sure will put it on there as well. So pirtobrutinib comes in that play. Um, PI three kinase will come in that play, and after that, I think we are really just, then we are talking about clinical trials like CAR T and. There are lots of clinical trials, but we really have to focus on that. Uh, and then, you know, I think if a patient is a young patient, uh, if someone is 45-year-old, 50-year-old, I think transplant, right? I mean, these patients who have already failed two lines of therapy, you are struggling with the third or fourth line of therapy. Um, you know, I think if they have access to CAR-T trial, I think that's appropriate. But if for some reason it's not happening or whatever, or they have failed CAR-T, I think we really should be thinking about getting them to transplant at that time. You know, again, you know, I think so. Those those options are third, fourth, fifth lines of therapy. You mentioned CAR T, uh, and I don't want to go into CAR T because it's still this is investigational. It's not really there's no commercially available products CAR T. What what new things are exciting you that we should really stay on the lookout for uh, CLL? Um, and I ask because there's always the theory um, that, you know, whenever we, we're using big guns, right? The BTK inhibitors and the venetoclax. Right. And, you know, by the time the patient fails these two therapies, their clone is really resistant. Right. So, you know, I mean, there, there will be no trial, I believe, that you can really look for right now that in patients with relapse disease, unless they fail these two drugs. Right. Right, and, you know, I don't know what what's exciting you. So you know, CAR T is something I, I close to my heart as well, and I actually do quite a bit of CAR T in ALL space as well. And as of last year, actually, I'm the director of our CAR T program for the Leukemia Group, coordinating the activity for CAR T for both ALL and CLL trials. So um, you know, so the, for CLL CAR T, sadly, and you know, so far has has fat has fallen behind DLBCL and ALL and obviously multiple myeloma approvals. And, you know, and very few trials have really been done. I mean, the really large prospective trial has been the trial with Lysocell, which was updated, not this past ASH, the previous ASH. So we are waiting for an update of that trial. I do think that in the CLL cells, we know forever that the, the T cells are dysfunctional. You know, they have high PD-1 expression and these T cells are dysfunctional. And if you're generating an autologous car out of these T cells and infusing back to the patients, you know, it's very likely that these cells may not be very functional and may not work very well. So I do believe and I think that allergenic cars are the way to go for pa for patients with CLL. You know, I've, I've, we have done several of the allo cars here. Um, I think we probably were the first group to do allo car in the United States for, for acute leukemia with ALL with UCART-19 back in 2016, 2017. Um, and we have done some CLL stuff as well, but I think things have not gone maybe as what we were hoping for. However, I think there are some new constructs, some new leads which are coming along with early phase clinical trial right now, or, or, or phase one unpublished, just ongoing clinical trials, which I think are starting to some, some real activity. So I'm really personally very excited about the field of CAR-T and I really believe that I think five years down the line uh, or maybe even less, I mean, for CLL, for ALL, you know, and DLBCL, they're already doing with Zima, you know, uh, frontline CAR-T kind of stuff. But I think that's where the field will move, right? Why can't you give for ALL um, debulking like hyper CVAD or whatever your favorite induction is uh, and then collect the cells. And if it's allo cells, you can just give allo cells as a second cycle or collect the cells after remission or after cycle one 
and give the cells a month later, like after two cycles of treatment. And then be done with it, right? You could debulk and then be done with it. So I think the same thing could be said for CLL as well in some sense. But we just need to get some better CAR T first for CLL. But I'm really hopeful that I think that's where the field will is moving. And I think in the next few years are exciting that we'll have those kind of products which you can use. It's like the most comprehensive review we've done on CLL. I've, I have not actually done an episode on CLL, so I'm really excited about this. Anything I should have asked you, I think we covered frontline therapy. We talked about relapse disease. We talked about investigations, MRD, short duration. Uh, we're not going to go into financial toxicity. That's actually another uh, episode by itself. But what else should I have asked you about CLL that you think is timely and listeners need to be aware of? I think those are the mainly, you know, main main points. I think one minor side point is this concept of Richter's transformation. Again, not to go into too much detail, but I think just for people to know, it's a it's a complication which can occur in maybe four to five percent of patients with CLL, and the treatment options are different. You know, there are more you need to use R chop, some chemotherapy, checkpoint inhibitors. There are some CAR T trials now being done for Richter's. Um, by specific antibodies are coming along, so. So I think that becomes a bit of a tougher disease, rictus transformation. Uh, but that's something which, you know, I think it's something, obviously, unfortunately, some patients have to deal with who have CLL and then they progress into this, what is called rictus transformation. Well, I this has been very enjoyable to me and I, I hope to listeners as well. I mean, I, I really think the advances in CLL um, are wonderful. And, uh, you know, we, I had an author uh, of the uh, Nathan Bardi with his book, Poor Blood and, uh, and Money, um, that uh, he wrote about the developed BTK inhibitors. And hopefully folks uh, have picked it up and, and, and read it. Uh, Nitin, this has been such a pleasure to have you on Healthcare Unfiltered. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Shadif. Thank you for having me here.